We are so thrilled that you're here. We have been praying and planning, and we're just super pumped to be here with you tonight. So thank you so much for coming. Um, a few things, if you haven't already um, checked in, which I think probably everybody has. It's so cold. People are just like coming straight in here, right by the check-in table. But if you haven't, go ahead and mosey to the back, like out on the patio, and you can check in. You're going to want to get a name tag because it has a number on it. We'll talk about that later. But um, <laughs> throughout the conference, um, these bathrooms right here at the, um, by the doors of the sanctuary, they are both women's restrooms. So throughout the conference, you can use both of those. There's signage on the door to not confuse you. Um, and lastly, there is a room for nursing mamas and a room for littles with wiggles. So if you don't know what the, where those are, just go ahead and ask a volunteer, and they would be happy to point you in the right direction. Well, hello, everyone. I did want to take a minute to introduce us. I'm Chesley. And I'm Bree. And we're so glad that you guys came. We're going to be your hosts this weekend. And wow, this is just, I'm just giving glory to God in my heart that you all came. So thank you. Um, as you already know, we are going to be talking about saying yes to kingdom living this weekend. Learning how to invite Jesus to rule over every area of our lives. And I know this is something that I need to hear. The Lord's already been stirring things up in me this week, so I'm so excited to hear what he has to say to each one of us. And my hope is that as this picture of kingdom living is colored in for us this weekend, we would invite God to speak into our hearts and to help us to have a fresh willingness and excitement to give him our lives in every area of them. So thank you for saying yes to coming and doing all the things that we know you had to do to be here this weekend. You have been prayed for. Every aspect of this event has been prayed for. So I know that God is going to speak to us this weekend. Yes. Yes, he is. Um, ladies, we thought that we would start this conference with a game. So, yeah, right? Some of you were thinking, oh, yeah, I knew I was going to like this conference. And others of you were like, where are the exits? So they're over there and in the back. No, I'm just kidding. You don't want to exit. Don't do it. It's going to be okay. Take a deep breath. This one, this game that we're playing is really low on the put you on the spot scale. So everybody's going to be fine. Let me tell you, here's the plan. Everyone in the room is going to stand up. Chesley or I will ask the whole group a question. You will remain standing if you can answer yes to the question that we ask. And you will keep standing until you have to answer no. For example, if we say, remain standing if you have a nose on your face. Well, I have a nose on my face, so I'm going to keep standing. I answered yes to that. And then if we asked, remain standing if you've ever mowed a lawn. True story, I have never mowed a lawn in my whole life, so I would sit down. And I am not the winner. So whoever is standing at the end wins the prize. Do you guys have it? Are we getting, did I explain it okay? Okay. Here we go. Everybody up. Everybody up. up. Everybody up. Everybody get up. <laughs> Woohoo! Look at you guys. See, you guys like this game already. Okay. First question. Remain standing if you drove or rode here in a car. We just didn't really want people to have to sit down like you stand Nobody up and sit rode their yeah. horse here. Nobody. If you rode a horse here, please raise your hand. Yeah, you, you'll get a special prize. Yes. <laughs> or even a bike. If you rode a bike here, I just wanted that person to get a high five. Okay. Everybody drove okay. in a car. <laughs> stand and well, remain standing if you ate breakfast today. If you did not have a seat. No breakfast Sorry. people sitting down. Okay, are you ready? If your phone is on silent right now, remain standing. And if you are sitting down, please put your phone on silent. This is your friendly reminder. See how we did that? Friendly yeah. reminder. It's a game and, you know, just keeping us real here at the same time. <laughs> All right, next question. Remain standing if you have a photo of an animal on your phone. Oh, we've got animal 
lovers. Alrighty. Look at this. I'm, I'm honestly surprised. We're going to be in trouble because we don't have this many prizes, guys. <laughs> We like the animal lovers, though. Okay, here we go. Remain standing if you've ever been to Disneyland. Disneyland. Not Disney World. Disneyland. Land. We, sorry, Judith. We need sorry. people to sit. I'm just kidding. No, no, no. I'm totally kidding. I'm proud of you all. I am a Disney fan, so sorry, guys. Oh. <laughs> all right. Remain standing if you have ever worn flare jeans or bell bottoms. Look at this. We've got animal loving, uh -oh. Disneyland loving, fashionistas. I love this. This is a specific crowd. I love what? <laughs> this is a specific crowd. It is. I like these people. Okay. Remain standing if you love pumpkin spice lattes. Love with capital love L O V E. Love pumpkin spice lattes. Okay. Now, you guys are my people. <laughs> Me too. I had one today. All right, you ready for the next question? Remain standing if you have 20% or more of your phone battery left. It's gotta be more than 20%. Phone, if I just, if you don't have a phone, you deserve to stand. Yeah. You just stay right yeah. on up. You, you're, you're in it with us. Yes, I am proud of you. You stay standing. I hope you win this whole thing. <laughs> okay. You can remain standing if you came to a women's gathering last year. Calvary Monterey Women's Gathering. Last year? Yeah, in this or last this year? year. Oh, in this past year. Yeah, sorry. Did I not say that? I'm sorry. In this past year, if you came into a women's gathering <clears throat> in, in 2022. 2022. Were you here? You weren't at this specific event, then no. Sorry. <laughs> well, we'll give you a high five later just because yeah. you don't have a phone. <laughs> all right, ladies. So how many we've got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, all right. Ten. Oh, Natalie's still with us. All right, guys. <laughs> You're going to need to get your purse out oh, for yeah. this. Or if you don't have a purse, your pockets. If you have on your person nail polish. Did everyone go down? Let's see it. Let's see it. We got a winner. We got a Let's winner. Woo! Woo! Look at her. Come on up here. Come on up. Wow. Out of all these people, you're the winner, winner. This is a gift card to Alta Bakery. Can you tell everybody your name? Ashley. This is Ashley, everybody! Woohoo! And if anybody's nail polish is chipped, you know who to go to. Congratulations, Ashley. Yes. That was impressive. <laughs> Don't you think games are so fun? I love games, especially games with all women. This is just fun. Okay, we have another opportunity to win because I know most of us, I didn't win that one either. So we have another opportunity. We've got a raffle. Who doesn't love a raffle, right? Okay, go ahead and look at your name tag like I said earlier. Top corner, you will see a number. That is your raffle number, okay? So tonight we're going to be raffling off a book, a journal, and another Alta gift card. So the book that we're giving away tonight is called Women and God. And here's a little review of it. In this warm, conversational, and sympathetic book, Kathleen Nielsen looks at what the Bible really says about women and what it reveals about God's attitude towards them. It's a super duper encouraging book and we're really pumped for whoever reads it and gets it. Actually, hope I win it. Does that, is that not, maybe that's not, maybe, maybe. that can't happen. They, they might not trust us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So Chesley, you ready? All right. Draw the I number. have in here everybody's numbers. I always feel like I'm on the Hunger Games. Oh, this is way better. All right. One, one, eight, one. Yeah? Thank you. Come on up. Yay. 
What's your name? Rachel. Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Here you go. Enjoy. <laughs> We're glad you're here. It is so fun winning stuff. Do you love it? I love it. We're going to have more chances to win tomorrow, so make sure you come back. Well, now it's time to jump into our night with some worship before we get to hear from our wonderful speaker, Sharon, um, and giving her first session. So let's pray. Will you pray with me now to prepare our hearts? Father, thank you so, so much for every woman here tonight. You know her intimately. You have created her, and you see her as precious and valuable and beautiful and worth dying for. So I pray, Lord, that she would be reminded of your incredible love for her tonight. Lord, and we just want to take a minute to quiet down. I pray that you would take away every distraction, all the things on our minds, and help us to just with open hands, give them over to you, Lord, right now. I pray, Father God, that you would speak to us tonight. We are here. We're ready to hear from you, Lord. Give us listening and soft hearts, we pray. So Holy Spirit, come. You are welcome here. You are invited here. We give you our attention. We give you our hearts now, Father. Thank you so much for this amazing weekend we get to spend together, Lord. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, ladies. Let's go ahead and stand and worship tonight. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. 
In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. children you start for the world we want to see people the way Jesus does your kingdom is simple Lord teach it to us your kingdom is humble as humble as death 
This king is a savior who gave his last breath. So may we die daily, our pride lay to rest. His kingdom is humble, and the broken are blessed. to us quickly forever our prayer your kingdom is coming Lord Jesus draw near hallelujah hallowed be the name may we live and breathe your praise And hallelujah, let all creation say, oh, the King of heaven reigns. Let's sing that again. And hallelujah, hallowed be the name. May we live and breathe your praise. And hallelujah, let all creation sing, oh, the King of heaven reigns. Oh, he reigns. Your kingdom is backwards. It flows in reverse. What you call a treasure, this world calls a curse. The small become great, the last become first. Your kingdom is backwards. Lord, teach us to serve as it is in your kingdom. Let it be in your church. Let's sing it together. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallowed be the name. May we live and breathe your praise. And hallelujah. Let all creation say. together hallelujah and hallelujah hallowed be the name may we live and breathe your praise oh hallelujah let all creation sing oh the king Such a beautiful sound, Lord, in your kingdom. Let's all sing that chorus together again tonight. Hallelujah, hallowed be the name. May we live and breathe. 
just the voices. just king. You are a kind king. You are merciful and compassionate. And this weekend, as we gather as women who love you and want to know you more and want to understand your kingdom better, and we want to say yes to it, God, would you help us to open our hearts and to open our minds to what that looks like and how we can invite you in, into all these spaces and places in our hearts and in our minds to allow your kingdom to come and your will to be done in our lives as it is in heaven. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love for us. And we just want to be open tonight to whatever it is that you want to teach us and help us to live out in our daily lives. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we say all these things. Amen. 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 Okay, you can take a seat. I am too short for that pulpit. <laughs> a little shorty up here. Um, hi, welcome. I'm Christina. If you don't know me, um, hi. Hi. Welcome. I am, like everybody else that's been staying from the stage, I'm really glad you're here. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I've had this thought rolling around in my mind as we've been preparing, because we've been preparing for a long time, not that we're wonderful or amazing for that, just these kinds of things. You know, we think about them for a long time and preparing. And one of the things that's been so cool that has stood out to me as this women's ministry team has been praying for this moment and um, planning for this time, I've just been thinking about how God knows every single one of you. You know, I don't know probably most of you in the room. And even the whole team that has put this event on, we don't like collectively know all of you by any means. And yet the person who's going to do the greatest work in your heart this weekend, he knows you so personally, like he made you. He formed you. He put you in your mother's womb. He's seen every day you've lived before today. He knows everything you've gone through in your past. He knows everything you're facing right now. He knows everything that's coming in your future. And as much as we've prepared, man, he has prepared you for this time. He really has. He knows you. And he's prepared this time for you. And he's prepared you for this time. So I just want to encourage you, be expectant, you know, be expectant of what God has for you in this weekend. I know he has something for all of us. Um, it's my job, my pleasure to introduce our speaker. So I want to tell you a little bit about her. Her name is Sharon Thomas, and Sharon has flown all the way from Virginia to come and be with us. That's so cool. What a sacrifice, right? Yeah. We're so blessed to have her. Um, I first heard about Sharon from Pastor Manny and his wife, Denise, who knew her while they were living in Virginia. And Manny gave me Sharon's name as a recommendation for someone who might be a great guest speaker for this kind of event for us. And as I started doing some research on her and looking into her resources, I thought, oh my gosh, she is a perfect fit. This is amazing if we could have her out. Um, I started looking into her, Sharon's stuff. Um, her main ministry is called uh, Established Footsteps Ministry. It's a website, and she has so many resources. But here's what I discovered. Here's what I discovered. Sharon Thomas is a woman who loves God and loves his word. And she is so passionate about it. She's not passionate about it in kind of a stuffy, highly 
academic, inaccessible kind of way. She is passionate about knowing God's word and loving the God of the word in a in a beautiful, personal, real, tangible kind of way. And the best part is that she's not just passionate about it for herself. She's passionate about equipping women like you and me to know and love God's word in the same way that she does. It's so cool. So we are privileged, right? Sharon has a great website. Like I said, Established Footsteps Ministries. She has a blog. She has a YouTube channel where you can engage with her teachings. And it's all so that we can know and love God a little bit more. So Sharon, why don't you come on up? It's a real gift to have someone like this teach us all weekend long. So why don't you join me in welcoming her? Thank you so yeah. much, Christina. So my sister's name is actually Christina, too. And when we were growing up, um, I don't know about you, but I didn't get along real well with her. I mean, I really love her now, but <laughs> back then we didn't get along great. And so I've never had somebody named Christina introduce me and say nice things. So I kind of just heard him like... <laughs> So I was thinking as you were talking, I'm just going to pretend like that's my sister saying nice things. And we do say nice things about each other. Now, we live in the same area in, in Virginia, like I say. But we are so glad to be here. Um, I've only been to California a few times. And so um, this is the first time I've ever been to the coast of California and gotten to see. I saw my first sea lion today. That was awesome. So he was just laying on a rock, taking a nap. So, But we're so glad to be here. And I say we too because my friend Kelly and my ministry partner, she's here with me. And it's just been a joy to get to spend the time even with her. And she loves God and loves his word just like I do too. And so uh, we want to get to meet you this weekend and get to know you. And like um, Christina said, you know, we do come all the way from Virginia and we are, we're on the coast as well. So we live right um, near Virginia Beach and, you know, are there. And so we're coast people. So it's the East Coast girls meeting with the West Coast girls this weekend. And we're going to have a good time in God's word. We really believe that. So, and uh, yeah, we do... Um, come from a ministry called Established Footsteps, and there's a QR code up here we'll put up right now. Um, if you want to scan that, it'll actually take you to a site that'll give you the links to all the things we have in our ministry. So if you want to just scan that, you can. We'll have some cards with that in the back tonight, too. But we do just really love God's Word. And I had some women in my life in my early years that just really showed me the value of God's Word. And so it's my joy to get to pass that along, you know, because they poured into me with that, and now I get to pass that along. And so I count this a real privilege to get to be with you this weekend and to get to share in these ways. And so I like to just get right to it. So I hope you do too. So I want to encourage you to go ahead and open your Bible to Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to get started. So... As you're getting settled in there into your Bible, let me uh, tell you a story. I'm going to rewind many, many, many years ago and tell you about a moment that took place when I was about eight years old. So I grew up in church. I don't know how many did, but I did grow up going to church. Whenever the doors were open, we were there, and the doors were open a lot, so we were there a lot, okay? And, you know, there were some things that just rang consistent in, in our church, you know? They just did them that way a lot. And one of the things that was that way was what we called the invitation time, okay? Okay. So if you grew up in church like me, you might be familiar with this kind of scene. Uh, the pastor, he'd been preaching for a while. And then there would come that moment. It took me a while as a little girl to figure out how, how this happened. But then I began to get pretty keen to it that he would look over to the organist and he would give her that nod. And she would know that was her moment to come up and start playing on the organ. This low hum that would be underneath, you know, him talking. Because that meant to, him, to her when he was nodding to her and she was supposed to come play the organ, that it was time to start the invitation. And what that invitation was, was a moment for people to come forward at the end of the service and say yes to Jesus. That they wanted to invite him into their life or maybe they were going to say yes to Jesus to recommit their life to Jesus. It was all about living in his kingdom. Now as a little girl, I saw this same scene take place over and over and over again. And one night at the age of eight, I said Yes. 
And I walked forward, and I accepted Jesus, and that was the night that I became a Christian. But ladies, I would tell you that even though I saw that happen over and over again all throughout my growing up years, and even though I actually did say yes, that night that I said yes, I really didn't have much idea at all of what I was really even saying yes to. I don't know if you've ever gotten an invitation before, and you've looked at it real quickly. You know, you look at the, the date, the time, but you don't really pay attention to the details, and then later you figure out, oh, I was supposed to do this or this or whatever with that invitation. I imagine we all have some kind of memory like that of a moment like that. But, and, and maybe some of you, like me, when you accepted Jesus, if you have accepted Jesus and said yes to him, at the beginning, maybe you didn't know a whole lot about what you were really saying yes to. And you know what, that's really okay because the Bible likens us becoming um, believers in Christ to a newborn baby being born. And when a baby's born, I mean, they don't know much of anything, right? But there comes a moment, there comes times when we, when we do need to know more, when we do need to understand and, and respond in greater measure to the invitation that's been given to us. And ladies, I believe one of those times can be this weekend. In fact, I believe the Lord has set this time aside for that to happen for all of us. So this weekend, we're going to pay attention to the details of Jesus' invitation to live and to thrive and to be blessed in his kingdom. And Matthew 5 through 7, which some of you may know that as the Sermon on the Mount, is much like an invitation from Jesus. And that's what we're going to be looking into all weekend. So let me give you some back drop notes on, on this sermon that Jesus preached. When Jesus preached this sermon, he was really just getting started in, in his ministry, and multitudes of people were beginning to follow him as he went about teaching and healing and all the things we read about in the Gospels. And there was this moment where he shared this sermon that literally was a straight-out invitation for people to live in the blessings of his kingdom. But it's important that we note that even though Jesus shared this sermon when his ministry on the earth was just getting started, we need to know that Jesus was not just getting started. You know that, right? He's always been. He's God. And so he's always been, always will be. And so we can know that even as far back as, say, like the moment in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve decided to say, no to the kingdom of God, and yes to the kingdom of this world. Jesus saw that. And he can see all the wreckage as he looks out at that multitude of people that he's getting ready to talk to in this sermon. He can see all the wreckage of sin that that choice and the fallout of that choice has caused. The sickness, the pain, the bondage, the shame, the addiction, the boredom, the strife, all the stuff, the discontentment, all of it. Jesus has literally been watching sin's destruction play out for centuries upon centuries upon centuries. And now he's standing face to face looking at this multitude of people who are living in that. And knowing that tells us a lot about how verse 1 begins of chapter 5. It says, and when Jesus saw the multitudes. See, this tells us why he shares all the things that he shares in these three chapters. It's because he saw the people. Now, certainly he saw them as a crowd. He looked out. He could see there was a lot of people. But way beyond what they looked like on the outside, he could see all the way into the interior of their hearts. Every need, every longing, every hurt, every purpose and plan that he created them for, he saw it all. Much like Christina was talking to you about just a moment ago. And then verse 1 goes on to say that he went up on the mountain. Now, obviously, he did that for some pretty practical reasons. He's talking to a big crowd of people. You got to get up high where everybody can, you know, hear you. You can talk to the large group. But besides just the practical, let's think about this for a moment. I think there's something that's a greater dynamic here. See, the things that Jesus is about to share in this sermon are literally truths from heaven, which are elevated way far up above the kingdom of this world. 
And the people that were there on the mount that day listening, they had never heard words from heaven before. Because it had been hundreds of years that God had been silent and had not spoke. So for generations, there had not been words from heaven before. But things were getting ready to change. Because Jesus' words are going to be literally like manna falling from heaven and, and, and like the, the living water from the fountain of God for that. And it helps us to see then why this last phrase of verse 1 is so important. Because it tells us that his disciples came to him. That's what it says. His disciples came to him. Now, this was not the 12 disciples. At this point, only four of them had even been picked. This was people just like you and me who decided, I want to hear what this guy has to say. So I'm going to climb up a little bit higher. I'm going to pick up my stuff. I'm going to trek up this mountain. You know, I'm going to drag the kids along with me, whatever. I've got to get up there and hear what he has to say. And then verse 2 says this. And opening his mouth, he began to teach them saying. Now, I, I really wish I had been there that day to hear what it sounded like when Jesus opened his mouth. Because, see, we know that Jesus is God. And we know that every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is powerful, right? And so this, this message that he's about to share has been pent up in his heart for centuries. So it's almost like you can hear this thunder start to roll in his heart as he's getting ready to open his mouth. And he looks at the crowd and he sees all that the kingdom of this world has wrecked in their lives. And finally, he gets to tell them about the kingdom of God. And he gets to invite them into a life where they can live in a different way than they have ever known before. And so he opens his mouth and he begins to teach them. And basically he extends one invitation after another saying to them, look, you can live this way instead of that way. I am inviting you to live in a new kingdom way. And ladies, I think that is right where Jesus' invitation to us begins this weekend. See, just like Jesus saw all the people in that multitude that day, saw them as individuals, we can know tonight, as we're here as a crowd of women, he doesn't just see us as a big crowd of women that came to Calvary Monterey on Friday night, October 15th. He looks here and he sees you. He knows you. He sees right into your heart. He sees us as individuals. So that means he knows where we're full and he knows where we're empty. He knows where we're at our best in this fall season of 2022. And he knows where we're broken. He knows where we need to be healed, where we need to find comfort. He knows where we're struggling to have hope. He, he knows where our heart is pure and where it's really not. He knows the places where we have said yes to the kingdom that he has offered us. And he knows the places where we're saying no. He sees us, ladies. He sees all the way into our hearts. See, Jesus isn't sitting on that mountain that day delivering this message, but he is here tonight. For those of us who know him, he is living within us. But he's also here amongst us, drawing us in and inviting us. And right now in this moment, that's what he's doing. He's inviting us to come up into his presence. To draw away from all the stuff, whatever your stuff is, and to come up and listen to him. And you know what your very first yes needs to be this weekend? Here I come, Jesus. Yes, here I come. We've got to make a decision right here at the beginning of this conference that we're going to lean in and listen to Jesus. And we're going to come up high and listen to Jesus. This weekend, that is our theme, saying yes to kingdom living. And I want to encourage you right now to start a list of yeses. Your yeses. Meaning every time the Holy Spirit enlightens this word to you. You know he's speaking to your heart and he's calling forth from a yes. If you're willing to give your yes, that you would write that yes down with confidence and with commitment. I have been praying for months that there are going to be so many yeses rising up in our hearts, but it really all starts with this one. Saying yes, Jesus, I'm listening. I'm coming up. I want to hear your words from heaven for me. So if you are in for that, I want you to write that yes down right now and begin your yes list. 
And one of the very first things you're going to find is that before Jesus ever asked us to say yes to him, you know what, ladies? He already said yes to us. He said yes first, starting with this one. He said yes to bless. He said yes to bless. See, that's the very first word out of his mouth, blessed. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is going to make nine statements just like that one. And we call these statements the Beatitudes. Because the way he phrases these nine statements are as if they are attitudes that would invite us into living in blessing. And that's exactly what they are. And they really hold two pictures. They hold a picture of our salvation in Christ, but they also hold a picture of our forward living in Christ. Once we've received Christ in salvation, what does it look like to live in him? Both of these pictures are in the Beatitudes. So we're going to look closely at each one, starting in verse 3, the one that says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we all know that the word poor describes someone who's needy, right? Who's, who's lacking. They, they don't have the resources that they need. But Jesus doesn't just say poor here, right? He says poor in spirit. So he's not talking about a poverty of tangible wealth. He's talking about a poverty on the inside. And here's the thing, ladies. At this moment, Jesus knew every single person in the crowd was poor in spirit. Because at this time frame in history, every person on the planet would have been spiritually dead, which is the epitome of spiritual poverty, right? See, the Bible teaches that before we receive Christ, that our spirit, the the part of us that is supposed to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit is dead. Because God will not dwell in the presence of sin, and and we're all sinners. So in relationship to Jesus, this is where everyone starts, poor to the core. Now, some people never acknowledge that. They won't acknowledge that, all right? But for those who say yes to that, that's who I am. I am poor of spirit. I'm literally dead spiritually. Well, what is the blessing that Jesus is inviting us into? It's right here. It's an open door into the kingdom of God. See, the kingdom of heaven, or sometimes as Jesus calls it here, the kingdom of God, is really what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. So I want us to pause for just a moment and really make sure that we get a definition that we can kind of use through the whole weekend of the kingdom of God. Now, the Bible has a whole lot to say about the kingdom of God, so we could literally have a whole conference about what that is. And so, you know, I'm not going to take a whole lot of time to explain that. But basically, I love the very simple definition that Paul uses in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. And he defines the kingdom this way. He says, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. See, when Jesus says kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, he's not talking about um, crowns and castles, you know, the things we think about that we see, you know, in kingdom things in the movies and all of that kind of thing. What he's doing is he is describing a way of living. It's a posture of heart that that people live in that really begins to manifest itself in a relationship between the king and the person who lives in his kingdom. Now, righteousness, peace, and joy, they don't say everything about the kingdom by any means. However, pretty much anything that you study or understand about the kingdom from scripture is going to be built on those things, righteousness, peace, and joy. So that's going to be the simple definition that we're going to use this weekend. And circling back then to that first blessing, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is essentially saying for everyone who will acknowledge their need and, and, and humbly say, I am needy. I, I'm, I'm so poor. I, I don't have what I need. This humility before God, this poverty of spirit, Jesus is saying, you're going to stand in a place of blessing. He's saying, you bring your need to me, and I'm going to pour out righteousness. I'm going to pour out peace, and I'm going to pour out joy upon you. Now, I don't know if you're seeing it here, but I hope so. Do you see the gospel right here? 
It's right in front of us because this is exactly what happens. It's how the gospel begins in every one of our lives. We acknowledge our need before Jesus. We say, I am poor of spirit, right? I'm spiritually dead. And Jesus then says, yes, you are, but come on in. I'm going to give you all the, the wealth of my kingdom. I'm going to give you righteousness. I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you joy. Righteousness, how does he give it to us? He forgives our sins, right? He, he gives us then the power to live in righteousness in the days moving forward. Peace, we have peace with God now when Jesus gives us this gift. And then we get to enjoy that peace as we move forward in life. Joy, this joy starts to well up on the inside of us when we are saved in Christ. But it's a joy that continues to flow. What did Jesus say to the woman at the well? He said it's going to well up inside of you and never stop flowing. Jesus is basically saying, you're not going to be poor anymore when we start this relationship because you're going to be wealthy in my kingdom with its main commodities, which are righteousness, peace, and joy. So being poor of spirit, it, it's literally just the beginning. It's the beginning of how we come to life in Christ, but we also have to understand it's also part of our onward journey in Christ. Because ladies, every day I wake up and one of the first things I say is, God, I need you right? I, I'm still in this world that's broken and full of sin. God's still working out his salvation in the way I express my life and how I think and feel and the choices that I make. And so every day I'm still needy, but every day that I wake up with that Jesus, I need you, he pours out some more of his righteousness and his peace and his joy and my life. It's a blessed way to live. It's a blessed way to live in the kingdom. And this is just the beginning. Because here's what also happens when we acknowledge how poor we are. We mourn. See, as we look at our lives and we see the sin that we have lived in, there's great grief. Which is why Jesus says what he does in verse 4. Blessed are the, those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, that can kind of sound a little off, right? <laughs> Because mourning does not sound like a place of blessing, and yet Jesus says it is. H how can that be? Well, like we just described, when at the beginning we come to Christ and we look in the mirror and we see all the wreckage that sin has caused. For ourselves, yes, but how many of us know our sin affects other people, right? So sometimes we're also looking at what our sin has done. There is mourning. Or sometimes we're looking at what other people's sin has done to us. There's mourning that comes with sin because sin causes death, right? And so mourning comes from that. But the beauty of the gospel message tells us in our mourning, we find comfort. Now, what is the comfort? It's Jesus himself, right? He is our comfort. As in our poverty of spirit, we bring our grief to him. And you know what he does? He just envelops us in this warm embrace and says, my righteousness can fix all of that. It can fix all of that. And that's what he does in our salvation. I mean, there is comfort in knowing your sins are forgiven and living in that day after day. The comfort of knowing you're at peace with God. The comfort of knowing I have a place in the kingdom of God and that my life is eternally secure. I'm on my way to heaven one day. There's salvation comfort in Jesus. But the blessing of his comfort is not just a one-time gift to us, right? Because how many of us know, even after you get saved in Jesus, there's going to be things that hurt in your life. There's going to be mistakes that you still make. And the beauty of the gospel message is that as he comes to life and lives on the inside of us, it's the Holy Spirit who lives there. And one of the names that the Bible gives to the Holy Spirit is the comforter. And so even in the, our forward moving days, when, when we have these things that bring grief, we can know that in Christ, in the kingdom, we don't have to mourn without hope. We don't have to mourn without comfort. There's comfort in our mourning. And there's something so comforting about even knowing we have a comforter, right? That we don't have to do this on our own. And then you know what happens from there? The blessings of the kingdom, it's like they just start gaining momentum. See, look at what Jesus says in verse 5. He says, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, I study mainly out of the NASB version, and it uses the word gentle. Some versions use the word meek. I believe both are appropriate because meekness is a disposition of strength that manifests itself in our attitude in a really gentle way. 
Now, you think about strength. In the world, strength is not visibly shown by being gentle, right? It's, it's when people rise up in assertiveness or, you know, that power or that independence. But in the kingdom, strength is very different. It shows itself very different. It's not visible in that, that assertive, harsh power, I'm going to take over kind of thing, right? It's visible in the person who gently leans into the powerful arms of God, trusting him. We meekly trust God. God. And there's a strength in that because he is strong. As I really sought the Lord about what does that look like? The word picture that the Holy Spirit gave me was this, and it's become so powerful to me over the last few months. This is what he said. He said, it's a rest, not a wrestle. Have you ever seen a child, or maybe you've done this with your child. I know my, my son, who's now an adult, when he was a little boy, he was really strong. Well, still is, but you know, Ben and Oh, we would wrestle. I mean, literally, like, physically wrestle, you know? But then there were those moments, too, where he was being sweet. They were few and far between when he was little, but, you know, and you just pick him up, and he just rests, you know? And it's that difference. And, and we, we, many times, we're trusting God, but, oh, we are wrestling in the trust, right? We're screaming at God. We're mad at God. Why are you letting this happen? Wait, versus we come to God, and we just lean in because we know who he is. Jesus is saying, if you live in the meekness, gently trusting in me, there is so much strength in that, and there's blessing there for you. And you know what the blessing is? It's incredible. It's the inheritance of the earth. You know what, ladies? We were never made to have to wrestle the earth for its blessings. In the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, God appointed all of it to be ours. He gave us the freedom to enjoy all that he created in the earth. And Jesus is saying, you know what? When you are in my kingdom, it's all yours again. Just trust me. Lean in to me. Will you say yes? But not only that, he also says, I will fill you. See, in verse 6, Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. When babies are born, one of the first things is they're hungry, right? And they're thirsty. And when we come to life in Christ, it is a spiritual birth. And so there's a hunger and a thirst of a different kind that begins in us. And it's a hunger and thirst for righteousness. See, we're hungry for a food that we have never eaten of before. And Jesus satisfies that with himself. And ladies, that literally is the substance of the gospel. That he fills us sinful people with his righteousness. But we have to also see this. Once we're saved, as we live in the kingdom, we are going to continue to hunger and thirst. See, I think that's the reason he used these words, because we all know what it looks like to hunger and thirst, right? I mean, you don't get hungry just like once a week. You get hungry every day, multiple times a day. I carry this water with me everywhere I go because I get thirsty all day long. And in our life in Christ, we are going to continue to daily, continually, sometimes in very intense ways, be hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So I'll just take a sip right there as we even do that, all right? We crave that. And Jesus says, I will fill you. I will fill you with that. Jesus alone can satisfy those cravings, and he wants to. He longs to. We don't have to live unfulfilled, unsatisfied, discontentedly, plodding through day after day, enduring unrighteousness all around us and even in us, right? We can be filled. Our lives can be filled with the fruit of righteousness. It's a blessing in the kingdom. But look at verse 7. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So a person described as merciful would be a person of a compassion, a forgiveness, and understanding. More than likely, this merciful posture didn't describe most of the people sitting on the mountain that day. Just like more than likely, it probably doesn't describe most of the people in our world today either, right? Because it's not our natural inclination to be merciful. And yet Jesus is inviting us into this. He's extending an invitation to receive his mercy and then to live in his mercy. See how merciful Jesus is to us, right? 
to give us all the blessings that he gives us in his salvation that we don't deserve. And now he's also extending this invitation to continue that flow of mercy. See, as we encounter and we deal with sinful people, just like Jesus dealt with us, right? We can extend that same flow of mercy that he gave to us. It was freely given to us, and we can freely give it out. And Jesus says there's blessing for you in that. The blessing being, you get more mercy. It's just a mercy that just keeps flowing, right? It flows to you, and then it flows through you back out to others, and then it flows to you some more, and it's just this flow of mercy. That's the way the kingdom functions, is what Jesus is saying. And there's a blessing. Everybody gets to live in that blessing of mercy. It's so good. What about verse 8? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Right from the beginning here in this sermon, we need to see that Jesus goes to the heart. He talks about the heart a lot because our hearts matter in the kingdom. It's not about everything on the outside. It's about the heart. And we're going to receive blessing, Jesus says, as our hearts are pure. Now, no doubt, Jesus purifies our hearts when he saves us. Without that, there'd be no hope for a pure heart at all, right? For any of us. But purifying our hearts is something that also continues to happen as we live and move and have our being in his kingdom. And it's also something we can't do on our own. Anybody ever tried to stop a certain sin in your life on your own? It doesn't work. You have to have Jesus himself to purify that in, in our lives. And we receive blessing as we are pure. Day after day. We have to take spiritual baths with Jesus. And here's the thing. It's not like going to the spa sometimes. They're not always enjoyable baths. And so like middle school boys, we can try to avoid them a lot of times. And we can be like, I don't smell that bad. I, I can wait till tomorrow. I'll get one maybe next week. I'll get a bath. Or here's what we do a lot as women. We look over at somebody else and we go, well, at least I'm not as dirty as she is. Right? And we think, I don't need a spiritual bath. And ladies, let me tell you, you need a spiritual bath every day. I need a spiritual bath sometimes several times a day. I need Jesus to purify my heart because living in this world that is not pure is very easy for our hearts to get dirty. Jesus says, pure hearts receive this blessing. And here's what the blessing is. It's so good. We get to see God. And ladies, there is a blessing in seeing God. You see his hand. You see his heart. You see his truth. And you, you understand it. You see his ways. You see his love for you. Not just his love for the world. His love for the world is awesome. But you see that he loves you. And it speaks to your heart. It takes your breath away, really. And it gives you energy to get up for the next day and take the spiritual bath the next time. Because you're like, oh, I saw God. I want to see him again. I'll come to the shower, whatever. If you need a pressure washer on my heart, God, go ahead. Right? Because I want to see you. Once you start seeing God, it is worth every single yes. It's one of the biggest blessings of kingdom living. As Jesus looked at the people on the mountainside that day, he knew they had not seen God. In a very long time. And he knew, because he was their creator, that he had created them for fellowship with God. And so it was just so lacking. So he wanted, he longed, I can just hear this longing in his voice, to bless the people with his presence. Just like he longs to bless us with all these things and more. He's just waiting, ladies, for our yes. And so he continues on in verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called sons of God. Peacemakers are people who make it their business to operate in and to spread peace. Jesus calls these kinds of people blessed in his kingdom. But why would somebody even want to do that? I mean, why would they be a peacemaker? I believe it reveals a person's true identity. See, just as with mercy... People who have received it, there's an expectation, Jesus says here in the kingdom, that you're going to give it. And people who have been given the gift of peace, they make it their business to multiply that peace and spread it. Because they have experienced what it feels like to be a child of God. 
And they know that's a gift. It's not something that they earn. See, he says the blessing of being a peacemaker is that they're called the sons of God. And they want to share that. I mean, how can they not share it? How can they not share the goodness of their father? See, peacemakers live with this knowing, I'm a child of God. I belong in the house of God. I belong in this kingdom and I have a purpose here. And, and my father wants to have a really big family. And so I will share this peace. And they value that so much. They value the kingdom so much that you know what peacemakers will do? You know what people who are living in the kingdom like this will do? They will even endure persecution for it. See, look at verse 10. Jesus says this. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. I know that sounds totally crazy. And I guess Jesus knew it would sound crazy. So he talked about it two times. He didn't just say it once. He talked about it twice. And, and, and it goes on in verse 11. He says, blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. He says, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. See, Jesus knows there's going to be people in the world who are going to turn on people who seek righteousness. He knows they're going to come after him, right? He already knows that. But he wants to declare his blessing right from the very beginning. That in his kingdom, people who will be willing to stand for righteousness, even in the face of persecution, they're going to be highly valued. Because he knows persecution is going to come. It's absolutely no question going to come from the enemy of our souls. He persecutes us. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's coming against us all the time. But it also may come in our life in, in some way. It might be a big way. It might be a small way from other people in this world. But Jesus says, even in that, there will be blessing. And you know what? The blessing comes back all the way full circle to where we began, and it's his kingdom. Because what does he say? Yours is the kingdom, but not just yours is the kingdom, but there's also going to be great reward for you in that kingdom. Ladies, Jesus, do you see it? He said yes to you over and over again. Yes to bless us with all of these blessings. He's inviting us to live in these things. And I hope that you've been writing down some yeses in response, because this is what it looks like to live in the kingdom. It's how we begin our life in the kingdom, but it is also how we move forward in the kingdom. He said yes to bless, but we also need to see this. He said yes to redeem us. See, in verse 13, he tells us some things about ourselves. And if you've got your Bible open there in Matthew 5, look at verse 13 where he says this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And then in the next verse, he says, you are the light of the world. Now, did you notice that Jesus said you are? Not you can be or you should be or I wish you would be. But he said you are. And he should know who we are. Right? Because he's the one who created us. See, the Bible reveals Jesus is our creator. And he was very intentional in how he created us. And part of his design in our lives is that we are salt and we are light. So I want you to think about what each of those things do. First of all, salt, all right? Salt especially brings flavor, right? But salt also preserves. Salt also heals. So as salt, we were created to bring flavor to this world. And then once the world was broken, we're also here to preserve, right, the goodness of God's creation and also to bring healing to it. That's who we are. What about light? Light does so many things. But I would say at the top of the list, light uh, reveals, light beautifies, and it also produces energy. So as light, we were created to beautify and, re I'm sorry, to reveal the glory of God, to make the world even more beautiful, right, with the glory of God, to bring energy, more energy to God's creation. That's who we are. But see, Jesus' words here revealed to the people of that day and ultimately to us too as he's speaking to us tonight, we're obviously, we're not living in the scope of who we are, ladies. See, listen to the fullness of what he says in verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become 
tasteless, how is it going to be made salty again? It's good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled by men. See, he's implying that his people, we've lost our flavor, right? And what about in verses 14 and 15? He says, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. But did you hear that? Jesus is implying we're not shining our light, like we're, we're hiding it. So, so why was he saying these things? I think it's because he was looking at people, this crowd of people, seeing them as a big crowd, seeing them as even individuals, and he knows their lives. He sees them, and he sees we're not living out these nine realities, these attitudes that he just talked to us about, that he just invited us into. See, they've become tasteless, so tasteless. In fact, he says this pretty hard. He says their lives are good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled by men. And ladies, you know what? That was the actual reality of what most of these people were living in at that time. See, they were living under barbaric Roman rule. They were living in a land that wasn't even their own anymore. And their lives were literally being trampled on as a people. And then, as well, their light was not shining. They were fearful for their lives, and they were hiding that light. And you know what? Maybe some of us tonight even feel just like that. We can relate to that. And we're very aware as well that what God has created us for, we might not even know what it is really, but we know we're not living in that. We're missing it somehow. Well, listen closely here because Jesus is just starting to open up their eyes to the hope of the gospel. See, they didn't know the gospel yet. They don't, they don't know any of this, that Jesus is going to die, that he's going to resurrect. The things that we know about, they didn't know this. So he's just starting to open up their eyes to this hope of his redemption. Because what he's really saying here is not that, well, you're just a bunch of losers, you know? He's not saying that at all. Like, you've lost everything. How, how in the world is this ever going to get fixed? No, what he's saying to them is, I see you in all your brokenness, but I am the one who can make you salty again. I am the one who can bring your light out into the open again. My plan, yes, my plan is to redeem you. And he means every single word he says of that, every single word, which just moves us forward to the next blessing, his next yes. He says his yes to keep his word. See, in verse 17, he goes on to say this, that he has come to fulfill every word that his father had ever spoken. And in verse 18, he says, all of God's truth, it's going to be fulfilled in me. And so this is another yes from Jesus to us. He's saying, I will keep my word. See, he wants us to know we can trust what he says. He'll be faithful to it. And he wants us to know, this is so important, don't miss this. He wants us to know how important his word is in his kingdom. In his kingdom, Jesus gives us a yes. I will keep my word. But he's also extending an invitation to us. And it's a big invitation. It's that we do the same thing. That we keep his word. See, look, right here in verse 19. Powerful words here. He says, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever keeps and teaches my words. See, Jesus just divided people into two groups here, right there. But he also talks about two additional groups in verse 20. So I want to look at those first, and then we'll come back to the ones in verse 19. In verse 20, he says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, those groups might not seem as obvious as the ones you might be seeing in verse 19, but I'm going to explain it all for you here, okay? So the groups are represented all by what people do with Jesus' words. Let's start in verse 20, and I'll explain. So verse 20, two groups, those who enter the kingdom and those who don't. And it almost sounds like nobody ever would be able to, right? <laughs> because in order to get in, what do you have to do? You have to have a righteousness that surpasses that of the scribes 
and the Pharisees at that time. And see, the scribes and the Pharisees, their righteousness was seen as the epitome of righteousness. So most of the people in the crowd that day would have already gone, well, I can't do that, right? But let's look at this a little deeper because by saying what he did, Jesus is really doing several things here. He's showing them their need. In other words, he's showing them how poor in spirit they are. He's also letting them know that the scribes and the Pharisees don't have enough righteousness either. And he's setting all of them up to see this truth that the only way their need for righteousness is ever going to be met is in him alone. See, surpassing the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is doable in one way only, and that's through Christ. And so that's what gives us the two groups in verse 20. We've got those who acknowledge their poverty of spirit. And they accept Jesus' righteousness as their own. And therefore, they get to come into the kingdom because their righteousness has far surpassed the scribes and Pharisees, right? But then you've got the group of people who don't enter the kingdom because they will not acknowledge their need for Jesus. So that's the two groups in verse 20. But what about 19? Here's what happens. We see two groups of people who are in the kingdom. So for those who said, Jesus, I need you. I'm poor in spirit. I want this blessing of your kingdom. And they come in once you're in, then those two, then that group of people gets divided into two groups. So you've got those who are least in the kingdom and you've got those who are great. The ones who are least experience the blessings of the kingdom in the least of ways. The ones who are great experience the blessings of the kingdom in the greatest of ways. And what is it? This is what's so important here, ladies. What is it that differentiates them? It's what they do with the words of Jesus. See, did you catch what he said? He said, people who annul his commandments, his word, they're going to be least. People who keep and teach them, they're going to be great. You know what, ladies? As I have meditated on this passage I have personally marveled to realize it is Jesus' intent for me to be in his kingdom. He wants me in his kingdom. And it is Jesus' intent for me to be great in his kingdom, to experience the blessings of his kingdom in great, great measure. That's what he wants. It is his yes to me. But I have also marveled to realize it's what I do with his words that determines the outcome of all of that. And those things are not just true for me. They are true for every single person. See, the invitation is for everyone. We all have the same invitation. We all get to choose what group we're going to be in. We're either going to enter the kingdom through Christ and be great in it. We're going to enter the kingdom through Christ and be least in it. Or we're going to not enter at all because we're going to deny our need for him altogether. The blessings are totally dependent on his yes to us, right? He said yes to bless us, to be our salvation. But my yes to his word determines how much I live and receive of those blessings. You know, I hope that everyone in the room can point to a moment in your life where you said yes to Jesus, where you said, I'm poor of spirit. I need you to save me. And in so doing, you've been born again as a Christian and you're in the kingdom. If you've not made that first yet, I want to, pr I've been praying, even in my heart right now, I'm praying that you're going to make that yes this weekend. And I'm going to talk to you more about that in just a moment. But whether you've said yes to Jesus' salvation in the past or whether you do it for the very first time tonight, what we must all, all of us in the room need to see, there is a yes in fact, there are many hundreds of thousands of yeses that flow beyond your first yes. Because Jesus has said a lot. He has many, many words that he's given to us. And ladies, what we do with his word will determine how blessed we live in the kingdom. So I want to circle all the way back to that story that I started telling you at the beginning 49 years ago. And that moment that I first said yes to Jesus. See, I shared with you how I really didn't understand what I was doing when I walked the aisle in the church that night during the invitation time. But what I didn't tell you is that I pretty much stayed in that place of ignorance until, um, you know, I, w I was 29 years old. So a little over 20 years. 
But honestly, I think that the word Jesus uses here in verse 19 describes it even more accurately than that. See, he uses the word annul. I don't know if you saw that or not. He says, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And ladies, that basically describes my life from the age of 8 to 28, 29. I, I was in the kingdom. I had said yes to Jesus. I had even gone to Bible college. I married a pastor. I was serving in my church in many ways, leading things. But my experience of the blessings of his kingdom were very small. And as year after year passed, and I grew more and more discontented with that, I, I was like, how, how could this be? Like, well, the answer to the question is right here. See, my day-to-day -day living could be described as somebody who annulled the words of Jesus. That's how. See, what does it mean to annul? It's worth asking the question because maybe there are some of you in the room who also feel like, why am I not living in the blessings of the kingdom? Like, I love God. I'm involved in my church. I, I do things for God. I, I, why am I not experiencing that? Let's look at this word annul. See, when you annul something, you basically reduce it to nothing. For various reasons, whatever they are, various ways, you take away the value of something, which represents what so many of us as believers do with God's word, even if not intentionally. See, Jesus knows that even though he is saying yes to, to bless us and he's offering us all of these things, he's inviting us into them, he knows there are going to be people me being one of them, probably many of you, who are going to take his words and in different ways, at different times, in different seasons, with different things that he says, we basically just reduce what he says to no active meaning in our lives. And he's not even just talking about the big things here. That's the thing. What does he say? Even the least of these commandments, he says. The point being, every word he says matters. For 20 years, I hardly gave the words of Jesus any attention. Everything else in my life had my attention, had my time, had my affection, had my energy. Now, every now and then, I gave Jesus words some time. I mean, when I was in church on Sunday, I leaned in and I listened. I'd start off the new year with my Bible study. I'm going to do this really good. You know, I, I mean, it's not like I never glanced at the word of God. But that hunger, thirst, daily, man, multiple times a day, listening, leaning in, all of that, no, that is not how I lived. And I realized that. I realized that I wasn't a keeper of his word like it talks about here. It's a long story. I'd love to tell you the whole thing. Time doesn't permit that tonight. But let me just say this. At the age of 29, everything shifted for me. God opened my eyes to see how important his word was. How much of a treasure the word of God is. That shift was his mercy. I did not deserve that. I was so poor in spirit. My heart for his word was so, so small. But when I cried out to him, he mercifully enlarged my heart for his word. And he changed me from being somebody who annulled his word to literally somebody who became amazed by it and kept it. And he called me to teach it. And so now, almost 30 years later, I can look back and marvel at the greatness of his kingdom blessings that he's built in my life. My life's not perfect by no means, but I literally can look around. I can turn around 360 and just see the redemption that he's built into my life, the salt, the light, the fullness, and he's still doing it. I am a blessed woman. I live in the blessings of his kingdom. Sometimes I weep over that because God has been so good to me. It's not just a goodness I talk about or sing about. I live that. I know that in my heart. And if Jesus was standing here visibly today and looking at me, he would see that in my heart. He saw something very different 30 years ago, but in his mercy, he rescued me out of that. But it took me taking the time and the energy. And even when I didn't have a heart for his word to say, God, give me a heart for your word. I am still learning. By all means, I'm still learning. I'm learning how to say yes. I don't say yes every time I should, but I'm learning how to say yes. And I want to ask you tonight to learn with me. See, we don't want to be people who annul his word. But the reality is, we often are. 
In so many ways, we reduce the, the meaning of his word in our lives. You know what? God help us. God help us. And he is this weekend. He is. He's inviting us afresh into his kingdom blessings. And I believe he wants to move us forward with our yeses to being women who do draw near to him, who listen to his every word and then say yes. He is going to help us be women who keep his word. And that's the group, ladies, you want to be in. You want to be in the group of women who keep his word. You want to be women who know what he says, who care about what he says, and you live in it. And oh, the blessings that flow forth from that kind of living. Many years ago, I missed the details of the invitation. We don't have to do that. They're right here. They're right here in the word of God. Tomorrow morning, we're going to come back. And we're going to listen to more of what Jesus had to say. And I'm looking forward to that. And I hope that you are too. But for now, as the worship team comes, I want to just leave you with this. If you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, you know that Jesus uses a lot of invitations to invite, or a lot of images, I should say, to invite us into his kingdom. And they're really powerful. We already saw tonight the image of salt and light, right? But I want to take you over to chapter 7 as we close. And I love this image. It's the gate. See, so listen to what he says in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. He says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who find it. But then he says, but the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And few are those who find it. See, there are two gates. The narrow gate and the wide. And did you catch the things that Jesus said about both? See, the wide gate is really wide. It's, it's very broad. And at face value, it must look pretty promising because Jesus says a lot of people go through that gate. But the sad thing is, is once they get inside, all they find is destruction. But the narrow gate is different. It's, it's narrow. It, it, it's small. And it's actually hard to find. And at face value, may not seem too appealing because Jesus says this. Not many people walk through it. But the amazing thing is, once you get inside, you realize that's where life is. Ladies, every attitude that Jesus has invited you into tonight, it's a narrow way to live. And most people won't readily choose to do that. Most people won't readily choose to be needy and poor of spirit. Most people won't readily choose to be merciful, to be pure in heart, to hunger and thirst for righteousness that goes all the way into the heart, right? I mean, let's be real. All of those nine postures of heart and the others and the things that Jesus talked to us about redemption and keeping his word, all of these things, they're not the popular way to live. And they don't seem like at face value, they're going to take you to anything of value. But you know what? When you get inside and you start living in these things, you're like, whoa, nobody ever told me. Look at this. Look at this. We walk through that narrow gate and we see those things. Hopefully tonight, as we have listened to Jesus' voice, there have been yeses rising up in our heart for those kinds of things. For some of you, it's your very first yes to Jesus. And you don't even really know what all that means. And that's okay. I didn't either when we started, right? Babies don't know a whole lot when they're born. But you know inside of you, you're like, I want that. I want to know Jesus. I want that kind of life. I am poor of spirit. And if that describes you, I want to ask you to go ahead right now and give a bold yes. Will you raise your hand? Yes. I see your yes. Yes. I see your yes. I see your yes. I see all of these yeses. Praise God for your yes. And ladies, if your hand is in the air, and if even if it's not yet, and you still want to raise it, go ahead and get it up there. I want you to pray with me as I pray, pray along with me in your heart so that you can receive Christ and be born again. Lord Jesus, we come to you poor in spirit. I know I need a savior. I know I need to be cleansed of my sin. I know that I am not content anymore to stay living like I am, that I need your spirit living on the inside of me. I need your righteousness. I need these blessings. I want to be in your kingdom. So tonight, Jesus, I say I am poor of spirit. Will you save me? 
Will you birth your spirit on the inside of my spirit and set me free to live in your kingdom? I thank you, Jesus, for this gift of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies, can we just give it up for the women who just said yes to Jesus? And you know what? If you're one of those ladies, we want to help you get a good start in this new life. And so there are some people here down on the side, right over here to my right, your left. If you would like to talk to one of those, we would love to help you. We want to give you a Bible. We want to just encourage you in that decision. So if, you'll, if you just made your first yes to Jesus, go ahead and just right now, in, in just a, a knowing of this is a, another good yes to make, just make your way over there to talk with one of those ladies. And they, that'll be a blessed conversation. I know that it will. I know that it will. But ladies, for those of us that have said yes before, I want to encourage you as well. I want to encourage you as well. And we have some moments that we want to invite you to step into. You know, Jesus has given us his yes. We talked about that tonight. And I hope there are some fresh yeses rising up on the inside of you. And those yeses might require you to walk through a narrow gate. But you know what? Jesus walked through a narrow gate that was really narrow. You won't ever have to walk through that gate. He literally died for the sins of the world. He's the only one. That gate is so narrow. He's the only one who will ever walk through it. He said yes to us, and we can look to him because of his yes and say yes to him. So as we close tonight and bring this time, it's not a close right this moment, but bring this time of teaching to a close, we want to invite you into a moment of communion with Jesus. See, we could just jump up and rush out of the room. We got to get home to this or that. But it, it's important to take a moment and sit in these yeses, the one that Jesus gave to us, the many he gave to us, right? And the ones that we want to give to him. And so we want to invite you into a moment of communion. We have elements in the baskets here on both sides. And you can take this time now to commune with him about the yes that he made for you and to share with him about the yeses that you have in your heart for him. If you've received Christ, we want to invite you to receive of communion. You're more than welcome to come to the table and partake of that communion. And you can do that whenever you're ready to do that. But we also want to let you know you can use this time. We're going to have some worship music to pray with a friend, to encourage them in prayer. We've also got some women in the back. If you want someone to pray with you, if you're like, I've made this yes, but I know this is going to be a really hard yes for me. Maybe you want somebody to agree with you in prayer over that. We've got people here to do that for you. We want to just create a culture of yes, celebrating the yes that Jesus gave to us in his kingdom but also, we want to make sure that the Lord knows tonight we're saying yes to him. And we want to encourage that in our hearts through prayer and then just through sharing that with the Lord in our friendship, in our relationship with him. So when you're ready, we invite you to come and partake and enjoy this time of communion with him and with your sisters in the room. Thank you. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He would give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing love The Father turned his face away As wounds which mark the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross, his sin upon his shoulders, a 
ashamed that hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was a His dying breath has bought me life. I know that it is in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ his death and resurrection why should his reward I cannot give an answer but this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's hymn, where your blood was spilled for my ransom. Human. 
word became flesh for my sin and death. Now you're in the Everything I once held dear, I count it all as loss. Lead me to the cross where my love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Lead me on myself, I belong to you.
Father God, thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Thank you that he walked that narrow path for us, that he was perfect and sinless for us and paid that price so that we could have this kingdom living, Lord. I thank you that we get to be a part of your kingdom. Thank you for all that you have done for us, Lord. We celebrate that tonight. We praise you, God. We're thankful for Jesus. Thank you for this new identity that you give us, that we get to walk in righteousness now, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done in this place tonight, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Man, that was so wonderful tonight. Aren't you thankful that we get to be a part of God's kingdom? That's right. I'm just so thankful for all that Jesus endured for us and for saying yes to us first, right? Well, um, thank you again for being here tonight. We, would, we did want to let you know that Sharon would love to say hello to you tonight and share some resources. So she is going to be in the back after this time. So please do feel free to stop by and say hello and um, get that QR code that she was talking about earlier. And we do want to invite you to stay for dessert now. It's going to be in the grill. So if you just kind of follow off to your right as you leave this building, you're not going to want to miss dessert. No way. Dessert's the, a great part, right? Okay. So tomorrow morning, we're going to continue our theme by looking at continuing to say yes to Jesus. Registration begins at 8 a.m., followed by a yummy breakfast. There's going to be eggs, fruit, yogurt, donuts, so that's like a real breakfast, and someone else is making it for you, so woohoo! Bonus. You're going to want to be here, right? <laughs> Worship starts at 9 a.m., so don't be late, and enjoy connecting over some dessert tonight, ladies. We had a great night with you. Yeah, have a great night. We'll see you in the morning.